I have been going through the book of Nehemiah and today I have come to chapter 12. Rika wanted to finish it but one chapter left. But anyway, it is going to be a last chapter and uh, Nehemiah would be gone from today so you will be gone too. So. Nehemiah chapter 12 and my title today is Serving the Lord in Our Time. Serving God when we have time in our hand. S doing something important when you have the time and the ability to do it. Because life is very uncertain. And our time can be taken away from us at any time. So therefore, in Ecclesiastics, Solomon says this way, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. And then he goes on to say, time to be born, time to die, time to cry, time to laugh and all. There is a, our lives are determined by time. We are time bound creatures. And what we see in Nehemiah chapter 12 is very much related to that. And the psalmist in 103 said this way, for he himself knows our frame, that means our body, our structure. He is mindful that we are but dust, made out of dust. As for man, his days are like the grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes. When the wind blows over it, it is no more, and its place remembers it no more. Like a grass, the hot air comes, the flower falls. The grass withers and its, its place remembers it no more. How sad is that? There was a beautiful plant, had a beautiful flower, and the flower falls. And its place remembers it no more. That's how Psalmist compares our lives. And Moses has a psalm in Psalm 90. He prays a prayer and he said, God, help me to remember the number of my days. In Psalm 90, verse 4, he said, For God, a thousand years is like a day. Then he says in verse 10, What is man? You have given him 70 years the most. Three scores, if not 10 plus. And after saying God is timeless, man is bound in time about 70 years. And then in verse 12, he would say, Lord, help me to number my days so that I may gain a heart of wisdom. Help me to number my day so that I may gain the heart of wisdom. In other words, help me to be time conscious, O oh Lord, that you have given me a certain limited time so that in this time I would be wise enough to do what is right. That I will spend this time meaningfully and that I may become a wise person, that I may gain wisdom by thinking who I am. And today in chapter 12, Nehemiah would somehow take us into this kind of mode of thinking when he simply lists us name after name. They have come back from Jerusalem, uh, Babylon uh, nearly 12 years ago. And along with other people, he started to build this wall. The wall was completed long before, but today he is dedicating this wall. As he dedicates this wall, he is listing certain people's name in a chronological or a time frame. And it defines when and how they were serving. So let me first read chapter 12, though it is 1 to 47. It's a long chapter. I'm going to skip some names that are wonderful to pronounce. <laughs> and uh, I forgive you if you mess up with my name. <laughs> because I do all the time with the biblical names anyway. So let me read Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 1. These were the priests and Levites who returned with Jerubabel, son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, Sheriah, Jeremiah, and Ezra. These are different names than Jeremiah the prophet, but Ezra could be also a different name there. Then in verse 7, he lists as many names who came with him. And then verse 7, these were the leaders of the priests and their associates in the days of Jeshua. Jeshua also meant Joshua. It was a, he was a high priest during the time of Jerubabel. 
Then he goes on to list how many people had come along with Zerubbabel and Joshua and how they did serve in Jerusalem. Then verse 12, in the days of Joachim, these, are the, these were the heads of the families, well, priestly families, and he goes on to list all those heads. Verse 22, the family heads of the Levites in the days of Eliashib, and then he goes on to list the names of these. And verse 23, the family heads among the descendants of Levi up to the time of Jonathan, son of Eliashib, were recorded in the book of the Annals, and the leaders of the Levites were, and he gives them, and then they, their associate who stood opposite them to give praise and thanksgiving, one section responding to the other as prescribed by David, the man of God. Now you have to read this in the context of a celebration of a, a dedication of a wall. There is a service being taken place. And he's setting up all these priests, and then he recounts the names of their ancestors and where they had come from. And they are, there are two groups we're going to see in later. There are two groups, one standing opposite the other and responding in a responsive praise and worship. Go to verse 26. They, they, were, they served in the days of Joachim, son of Jeshua, son of Josdak, and in the days of Nehemiah, the governor, and the Ezra, the scribe, priest, and the scribe. And continue, 27. At the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, the Levites were sought out from where they lived and were brought to Jerusalem to celebrate joyfully the dedication with songs of thanksgiving and with the music of cymbals, harps, and lyres. The singers also were brought together from the reason around Jerusalem from the village of so many villages there again. And then go to 30. When the priest and the Levite had purified themselves ceremonially, they purified the people, the gates, and the wall. I had the leaders of Judah go up on top of the wall. I also assigned two large choirs to give thanks. One was to proceed on top of the wall to the right toward the dung gate Hosea and the half of the leaders of Judah followed them, along with Azariah, Ezra, Meshulam, and then go to verse uh, 36, with musical instrument prescribed by David in the man of God, Ezra the scribe led the possession. At the fountain gate, they continued directly up the steps of the city of David on the ascent to the wall and passed above the house of David to the water gate on the east. The second choir proceeded in the opposite direction. I followed them on top of the wall. And then go to verse 14. The two choirs that gave thanks then took their places in the house of God. So did I together with the half of the officials. And then go to the uh, last part of verse 42. The choir sang under the direction of Jezra. And then continued reading from there. And on that day, they offered great sacrifices, rejoicing because God had given them great joy. The women and children also rejoiced. The sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be heard far away. At that time, men were appointed to be in charge of the storerooms for the contributions, first fruits and tithes. From the fields around the towns, they were to bring into the storerooms the portions required by the law for the priests and the Levites. For Judah was pleased with the ministering priests and Levites. They performed the service of their God and, served, and the service of purification, as did also the singers and gatekeepers according to the commands of David and his son Solomon. For long ago, in the days of David and Asaph, there had been directors for the singers and for the songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. So in the days of Jerubbabel and Nehemiah, all Israel contributed daily portions for the singers and gatekeepers. They also set aside the portion for the other Levites, and the Levites set aside the portion for the descendants of Aaron. We see here many, many names. So the first thing, Nehemiah, is listing so many names. Not only in this chapter, we have seen from the beginning of Ezra until towards the end, we will see Nehemiah and Ezra, both of them are found of names of the leaders gone by. And in this chapter also, Nehemiah is listing the names of the leaders that had gone before him. So from there, I take the point 
that Nama is such a great leader who has great leaders around him. A great leader always has great leaders surrounding him. And the, the reason great leaders surround a great leader is because the great leader never makes everything about himself. It is not about me. It is not about myself. It is not what I want. It is what God wants. It is what God has for the people. So we see here the reason he's listing the names of these leaders. The people are already standing by both sides of the choir, about to sing and worship the Lord. They're about to go on top of the wall from both directions and finally meet in one place and come to the house of God. And he lists the names of leaders who had come with Jerubabel. Now Jerubabel had come about 100 plus years before Nehemiah. And they had come along with many other people, but they could not, could not really restore the dignity of Jewish nation. They lived in disgrace, they lived in fear, they lived in the midst of people who were mocking them. And they had also compromised their faith, their convictions, they had lost their identity. Some of these leaders were not great, actually. They were very hopeless leaders. In fact, one, of, one or two leaders will go on making mistakes after Nehemiah returns to Babylon. But Nehemiah humbles himself. He makes of himself nothing, but he puts these names in the list. And these are the people who made this city great. Now, you have to remember, when he came, many of these leaders opposed Nehemiah. They had opposed Ezra. They had opposed many other people. God had sent prophets to inspire them to build the house of God, build the city of Jerusalem, but they would go on opposing. But when the time to celebrate the victory, the time to celebrate the construction of the wall, Nehemiah makes it so simple and said, it's not only me. There had been people before me. And there will be people after me too. There will be people after I'm gone, when work is done. Someone will have to carry on the work that I have done here. So the first point I want you to remember in our life is that when we do something for the kingdom of God, we must be mindful of not making it for ourselves. We are not the center. We, the world will run without us also. Now, Yes, God has called us very specially. He has given us call. He has given us gifts and talents. He wants us to use those things for His glory. But the moment we make ourselves more important, uh, then we need to remember, actually, God doesn't need us. He could use anyone else. The world will go on. After I go from this church, the church will go on. When I was not here, the church was there. So there are people before us, there will be people after us. The thing that connects us is not what, who we are and what we are doing. The thing that connects us is the work of God. Nehemiah is connecting himself from the past and will live to the future generation to connect himself to what he has done because he is doing what God has called him to do. You and I are not so important as much as the work God has called us to do. The work of God is more important than the worker. You see in the church, in Christianity today, the church has become the mockery in the eyes of the watching world is because many a time the Christians make so much of themselves. The pastors make so much of themselves. Christian leaders are so self-obsessed and when I am self-obsessed person, then I will not care for the glory of God, and I will not care for the people of God. I will only care for my ambition, my reason, my dream. And great pastors, great leaders, they sound amazing when you hear to them, but behind that greatness, oftentimes, is hidden the self-aggrandizement. And Nehemiah is such a man who refuses to lift himself up and he is lifting up these people, in fact, who had opposed him. That is one I wanted to 
put across to you today that we are not so important, but what God has called us to do is more important. What you have in your hand, what God has called you to do, even after you're gone, God will continue to do that. And that's how you will be connected. And the reason he lists his name and then he puts them in a context. Now, next point is he also gives the historical time frame of their ministry, their service. He tells when they were serving. He not only gives the name, he also gives the chronological background. That we see in verse 1. These were the priests and Levites who returned with Jerubbabel. Now, he's going back to Jerubbabel 130, 40 plus years ago. And then in verse 7, he says, These were the leaders of the priests and their associates in the days of Jeshua. The phrase, often repeated phrase there is, in the days of, in the days of so-and-so, in the days of so-and-so. These people were serving in the days of so-and-so. In verse 12, in the days of Joachim, these were the heads of the priestly families. In the days of so-and-so. Continue in verse 22 and 23. The family heads of the Levites in the days of Eliashib. Now, Eliashib wasn't a great priest, but he is there. He will be mentioned even next chapter as well. And his son, Jonathan, until the, his son. Verse 23. The family heads among the descendants of Levi up to the time of Jonathan, son of Eliashib, were recorded in the book of the Annals. And finally, in verse 26. They served in the days of Joachim, the son of Jeshua, the son of Jezda, and in the days of Nehemiah, the governor. This is now present from the past until present. And in the days of Ezra, the priest and the scribe. The point I'm trying to make is, we are time-bound creatures. And God gives us certain number of years to glorify Him, to serve Him. As these people had, the, some of them were in the days of Zerubbabel, some of them were in the days of Joshua, some of the, them were in the days of Darius, some of them in the days of Nehemiah, some in the days of Ezra, and so on and so forth, They're implying that we are time-bound creatures and we may not have all the time in our hand to serve God tomorrow. <coughs> they were faithfully serving God in their times. And what they were doing was so important that God continued to do so even today. And because God continued to do so, they are now connected. So the things that connect us is not ourselves, but the work of God. What God is doing will continue to be in this place until he comes again. Until his work is completed, we will be continuously doing what God has called us to do. Nehemiah is calling people to serve the Lord. And now he has completed his mission. And then he is connecting them in the past and leaving them up to an open future and giving them the idea that the thing that will connect them to the future generation is the work of God. If you do what God requires, your work will remain. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul said, in the last of days, when we stand before God, whatever we do, whatever we build, whatever we construct will be tested by fire. If our work is done by gold and silver and precious stone, it will last. But if our work is done by hay and all kind of wood and destructible things, it will be burnt. It will not last. The only thing that will last is the work of God. And God has given us this certain amount of days in our hand. What you do for yourself is not going to last, my friend. What you do for your country also may not last. What you do for 
your well-being, your physical well-being, your spiritual well-being, your mental well-being, if it is not in Christ, it is not going to last. But whatever you do for the things of God, for the kingdom of God, that is going to last. And to do so, God has given you this time. The Bible says, today is the day of salvation. If you hear the word of God today, do not harden your heart like the people did in the days of rebellion. Do not harden your heart. Obey God today. Accept Christ today. Do something for the kingdom of God today. Don't wait for tomorrow because tomorrow may not come. Today, if I think about myself, if I think about my own self-centered self-will and self-ambitions, and I say, if I have this, if I have that, then I will do something for God, it may not come. The tomorrow may not be there. Some of these people that Nehemiah is listing, they made terrible mistakes. What they were thinking was, oh, let me build my own house. And instead of coming to Jerusalem, instead of living in Jerusalem, they were telling, no, let us not live in Jerusalem because Jerusalem is the center of attack. Every time an enemy comes and they attack and they destroy and our houses and everything. So let us live outside of Jerusalem. Let us live among the heathen so that we will be somehow blending in and will not be the target of the enemy. The, these leaders were thinking like that. And ne Nehemiah comes and says, no, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to build. Today is the day to construct the house of God. Today is the day to celebrate. Today is the day to worship God. Today is the day to listen to the word of God. And he tells them, these were the people who served God during the days of Joshua, during the days of Jerubabel, and now during the days of Nehemiah and during the days of Ezra the priest. So first thing name list indicates I am not so important. There are many other people who have done it. Second, in the days of indicates that I may have a limited time. And if I don't do what is right today, if I don't do what God is calling me to do today, tomorrow may not be there. What God has called you do it soon, my friend. Third thing that I see from verse 27 to 42, that is Nehemiah takes the time to celebrate. Nehemiah is now celebrating the completion of the wall. In verse 27, at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, the Levites were sought out from where they lived and were brought to Jerusalem to celebrate joyfully the dedication with songs of thanksgiving and with music of all kinds. Now you have to remember, Nehemiah comes to Jerusalem about 12 years ago and he completed the wall in 52 days. The wall has been built long ago. In fact, Nehemiah must have built many other things inside the city. And last week we saw how he began to call people to come to Jerusalem and populate the city because they were not willing to live in the city. Even though Nehemiah had completed the wall, he was postponing the dedication or the celebration. For some reason, he was so caught up in the work he wanted to work and work and work. And finally today, he takes the time to celebrate. And as he was planning for this celebration, what we see him, wall was completed very soon, but he has taken this many years to celebrate the completion is because he was not merely interested in the wall. He was not merely interested in the city. He was interested in building a people. So we saw time and again how he gathered these people in the city squares. He makes Ezra to teach them the law of Moses. And they began to celebrate. They began to read the word of God. And because they read the word of God, they had a great revival in their life. They began to seek God like never before. So Nehemiah was not only building a wall, he was building a people. He was teaching them the laws of God. He was training them into the word of God. As a result, we saw great revival come. And because of the revival, now 
the people are in a mood to celebrate. Because now they have begun to understand that they are not merely a, a, a nation, a, a tribe, a people group. They are special people group. They are a holy nation, royal priest, that God is using them for a divine work. And they come together today to celebrate this amazing work God had begun in their midst. And in celebrating, what do they do? They are singing songs. They are giving thanks. And there are musical instruments and so forth. When you come to church, uh, our church may look nothing compared to what they were doing in that day. I know there are some churches who are very solemn, so holy, so dignified with only piano, no more noise, no hallelujah, no praise the Lord. And people like that. Everyone has different taste. But here we see, uh, look at verse 43. And on that day they offered great sacrifices, rejoicing because God had given them great joy. The women and children also rejoiced. <coughs> as if they were not so important, right? <laughs> it is true. In the temple, not much work was given to the women. Women and children were always neglected in Jewish temple system, actually. But here we see Nehemiah is allowing the women and the children to take part in this great worship and celebration. And how did this uh, celebrate the sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be heard far away. The surrounding nations heard a sound of praise and worship far from them. They began to celebrate. And it is right for us also to take time to celebrate. Sunday ought to be a celebration of life, actually. Sunday is not supposed to be a worship day designed for you so that only on Sunday you come to worship. In fact, what you do from Monday to Saturday will determine what you do on Sunday in the church. If you've been, if you've been walking with Christ from Monday to Saturday, Sunday will be a great day of celebration. But if you're not walking with God from Sunday, um, Monday to Saturday, then Sunday is going to be a burden someday. Though it is a good burden, it will keep you surviving. Okay, Sunday worship will not let you perish. It will survive somehow your soul. But you will not thrive. You will not come to church, praise God, hallelujah, gratefully worshiping God, willing to serve, willing to sacrifice, willing to do whatever it takes to praise God. Because somehow... Our Mondays, our Tuesdays, our Wednesdays and Thursdays and Saturdays become so burdens and cumbersome. And uh, we find ourselves tangled with the cares of this world, worries about things in this life, worried about families, our future, our job, our health, so many things come along. And if we have all focused on those things of the world, Sunday becomes burdensome. And I tell you, as a pastor, I am not afraid. If you're a complaining Christian, or rather say, if you're a complaining church member, then you don't worship God from Monday to Saturday. You only worship God on Sunday, and then everything goes wrong on Sunday. The, the, the PowerPoint doesn't work, the piano doesn't work, the microphone doesn't work, and you feel irritated. And one person in the choir makes a mistake, you don't want to worship God anymore. Something, a church member comes and takes your seat and you're mad at that person again. Uh, someone, you wanted to drink a coffee and the last piece was there and someone took it away and you're so angry at that. Sunday would be a day of celebration if we worship God from Monday to Saturday. Amen. So here, Nehemiah was able to bring these people to such a crescendo of celebrating God's goodness because for many months now,
they have been worshiping God. They have been repenting. They, they stand in the city of Squire for hours and hours. They listen, reading from the book of the Lord Moses. And they have turned their hearts towards God. And here they come. And now we talked about the gates. There were 12 gates in the city. We mentioned in our previous messages, if its gate indicates something, one person, one choir goes all the way to Dung Gate, another person goes all the way to Water Gate, and finally they cleanse themselves by the water of the Holy Spirit or water of God's Word, and then they come down to the house of God. Celebration, worship will cleanse you, will purify you before God. And these people are worshiped. Wall is a very big wall here. You have to think about the Great Wall of China. <laughs> you know, they, are, they, are, they are walking on top of the wall. A large number of group can walk on top of the wall. So it is not a small, simple wall. And it was something to celebrate for them. And therefore, they began to celebrate. But you know, celebration is so easy. If you have not taken the time to Consider what goes before celebration. Think about Nehemiah, how much he struggled, how much hard work, how much of a dedication, how much of a commitment, how much of a sacrifice. Think about what the people did. They gave all their money, their gold, their silver, and they spent days, months into it. Hard work is required for celebration. If you are not willing to work hard, you will not see many days of celebrations. I always say poverty begins with laziness, material poverty. That's the Bible says. The Bible says a little bit of folding of your hand and a little bit of sleep brings poverty like thieves or robbers. So poverty begins with laziness, but later many other things may keep that person under poverty. But the beginning always comes with laziness. So is spiritual poverty. If you're a spiritually lazy person, you will be spiritually a very poor person. If you don't take the time to read the Word of God, if you don't take time to pray in your private life, if you don't take time to take part in church ministry or activities, somehow you're going to empower yourself. And then, the, the, when people begin to shout and praise God, that is going to irritate you because you can't do it. You have no reason. You can't find any reason why to shout. Why to be so passionate about God? Why to sacrifice everything I have? Why is this pastor always calling me to give an offering all the time? Or why do I have to go and share the gospel? Why do we need to forgive those who hurt me? Why do I have to pray for those who are sick all the time? Why no one prays for me? Spiritual laziness will make us spiritually poor people. But these guys, these people have done a hard work and therefore they can celebrate today. You want to see many days of celebration in your life? Start working hard. Spiritually and materially as well. No boss is going to like you if you're a lazy worker. And lastly, the joyful celebration motivates people for two things. First, we saw name list means Nehemiah was not the superhero alone. He acknowledged that what he could do was a result of many other people's input in time past and at present. Then he gives the time frame in the days of in the days of saying that we have limited time to serve God. And if we miss that time, we miss a lot in life. Thirdly, he takes the time to celebrate. All the time, if he could go on and on and tell them to work and work and work, and they would lose heart. But he begins to celebrate, and they did a wonderful work. They were singers, they were musicians, they were priests, the Levites, and everyone is taking part in celebrating. And finally, the joyful celebration then motivated these people for two things. Number one, they purified themselves. Verse 30, it says, 
when the priest and the Levites had purified themselves ceremonially, they purified the people, the gate, gates, and the wall. And verse 45, they performed the service of their God and the service of purification. They had to purify themselves. They had to sanctify themselves. They had to make themselves holy before God. And only when you truly, truly understand the joy of the Lord, the beauty of worship, the beauty of what Christ has done for you, you also would like to see yourself being pure. One of the most disturbing things in our Christian walk, one of the most powerful things that makes us impure in our walk with Christ is our human relationship. Every time we think about impurity, we think about maybe alcohol, or drugs, or sex, or something else. But the most powerful thing that makes us impure is our relationship with one another. Of which the Hebrews writer says, may live in peace with everyone. Because once you have bitterness towards someone, that bitterness becomes a root, and that root of bitterness then will defile you completely. So here these people are purifying in a sense, they are forgiving one another. They are not hating one another anymore. They are in unity, absolutely now united. When Nehemiah came, you remember, they were divided. They were impure people. But this time, they are absolutely united with one another. And of course, uh, the Levite law says how to purify once you were defiled, and they perform the ceremonially cleansing methods of purifying themselves. But today, you and I are only made pure because of Christ himself. You and I cannot make ourselves holy. You and I cannot make ourselves pure. But he has taken our place, and therefore, we are holy. We are pure. And we are able to stand before the both sides of the aisles and praise God. And the Hebrew chapter 4 verse 16 says, Because of Christ the high priest, now we can boldly come before the throne room of God's grace. We can enter into the holy of holies and worship God because he has made us holy. 1 Corinthians 1 30, Jesus Christ is our holiness. He is our license to go to God. If you accept him as your savior, if you accept him as your substitute, he becomes your holiness. He becomes your purity. Without holiness, no one will see God. Again, Hebrews writer. Talking in the context of interpersonal human relationship. The thing that makes you unholy before God is when you fail to love your fellow human being. In 1 John, John says, if you are in the darkness, you don't know God, and that is also in the context of loving your fellow human being. If you're walking in darkness, it means you don't love one another. When you don't love one another, you make yourself bitter, impure, and then you cannot see God. If you, if you cannot love your brother who you can see, how can you say you love God whom you cannot see? What makes us wanting to be holy? What makes us to be honest person? What makes us to live truthful lives? What makes us to refrain from evil things is when you truly, truly begin to understand what Christ has done for you and begin to celebrate that. When you truly begin to celebrate the victory Christ has given to us, you will not like to defile yourself. Have you tasted the goodness of the Lord? <coughs> Taste and see that the Lord is good. Have you tasted the forgiveness of Christ? Have you tasted the loving kindness of God? Have you tasted the blessings that come by trusting His promises? If you have done, you will come to church celebrating. And that will continue to motivate you to live a holy and pure life. So these people are motivated to purify themselves. Second, they were motivated to sacrifice. They were motivated to purify. They were motivated to sacrifice. Listen to verse 44. At that time, 
men were appointed to be in charge of the storerooms for the contributions, first fruits and tithes, and then you go on. They began to collect offering again. They began to collect tithes and the first fruits because once they began to celebrate the goodness of God, they want to continue to do so. They want, uh, the, the, the phrase says, they were pleased with the, uh, the Levites and the priests. They were pleased to support the Levites and the priests. They were also pleased to support the singers and the, the people who helped them with music. The point is, a church that celebrates life, a church that celebrates the forgiveness in Jesus Christ, the church that celebrates the cross of Jesus Christ, the church that celebrates the gospel of Jesus Christ is a sacrificing church. A church that will contribute for the mission, a church that will contribute to help the poor and the needy, the, the orphans and the widow, the church that will like to help one another. If you see a fellow brother and sister in need, a church that knows how to rejoice in Christ will go forth and sacrifice to a sister to help someone. Here we see the Jews once again motivated to bring tithes and offerings and first fruits. But in time past, they had forgotten them. They were all worried about themselves. They all were thinking how to make a living. But today, we see them experiencing God's goodness in their own life, experience the blessings of God, and as a result, they are motivated to sacrifice for Do you love to contribute? Or rather, mm. when you are able to contribute towards someone or something for the kingdom of God, do you rejoice? I'm sure you do. Because there is a great joy when you can bring a smile to someone's face. There is a great joy when you can lift someone from their misery. There is a great joy when you can sacrifice something behalf of someone else. And David is a man while he was repenting from his mistakes and finally God heard his prayers and he comes to a, a field where he wanted to sacrifice an offering to God, sacrifice to God and he comes to this uh, farmer and the farmer said how come you king in my field here? And he said I have come here to offer a sacrifice to the Lord. And this farmer says oh my king take everything my bullocks and everything and sacrifice is all yours, O king. And the devil said, No, no, here. I will not offer anything that costs me nothing. I will not offer anything to my God that costs me nothing. What have you sacrificed for the kingdom of God that was something <coughs> costly to you? I have met people, wonderful people of God who have sacrificed so much. And you can see, they truly, truly value what God has done in their life. They celebrate what God has done. They are joyful for the fact that Christ has forgiven their sins. They are joyful for the fact that Christ is building their life. They are joyful for the fact that they are not left alone. There are promises of God to take care of them. And they trust God. So a church that celebrates the work of God is a church motivated to live a holy life and a church motivated to sacrifice material comfort so that the kingdom of God continues. Listen, the last verse. So in the days of Jerubbabel and of Nehemiah, all Israel contributed daily portions for the singers and gatekeepers. They also set aside the portion for the other Levites and the Levites set aside the poor portion for the descendants of Aaron because the, the temple priesthood was so important in those days. And they say, we need to continue to this. We want to continue to worship God the way we did today. We want to continue to celebrate the victory God has given to us. And we need Levites to help us in doing that. We need leaders to do these things. And therefore, we will sacrifice. We will contribute. And we will set aside a certain amount of money and material things so that the work of God continues. Let us remember, therefore, those who have gone before us. Don't forget who have gone before you. Don't forget your parents, how much they have sacrificed for your life. 
Don't forget your pastors that have gone before you. Don't forget the leaders that have left legacy behind. You and I are here because of them. And then let us not forget that we have a limited time in our hand. And once we are done, it will be only in the days of so-and-so, in the days of so-and-so. If we had worked for the kingdom of God when you were in Korea, if you are a foreigner, if you have worked for the kingdom of God while you are here, if you are a Korean, it will be remembered. But if you work only for yourself, then when your life is done, everything is done. So let us remember we have a limited time. Serve God when you have opportunity. Sacrifice if you have something, because time may not come to do so in time in the future. Thirdly, let us celebrate the victory Christ has given in our life. Let us learn to rejoice because it is Nehemiah who says, Rejoice for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Are you a joyful person? Now, by nature we are some extroverts, some introverts. That's a different thing. But no one can be joyless. You can be joyful if you're an extrovert. You can be joyful even if you're an introvert. An introvert may be rejoicing inside it's true. I was a very shy person. Now you may not believe it. I never knew how to speak. At all. But when God began to work in my life, I was a part of a church that never made noise. It was a strong Baptist church that sang 10 minutes, prayed 10 minutes, preached 10 minutes, and finished in 30 minutes. But here I was, I wanted to worship God. And I used to bite my tongue and worship God. Because I was afraid to speak. You can rejoice in your private life. You can go into the closet. You can lock your room. Rejoice. No one is going to say anything. Be a joyful person. Once you begin to celebrate the life that Jesus has given to you, you will be longing to be a holy person. You will not like to Decide, uh, allow the thing to defile you, or a person to defile you, or anything. Do not let anything defile you, my brothers and sisters. Because what happens is, when you defile yourself, then somehow you cannot experience this amazing, joyful attitude before God. You lose your joy. God has forgiven you. I tell you, all our sins have been done away in Christ. Your sin cannot separate you from God. The thing that defiles you will not be able to separate you from the love of God if you've accepted Christ as your Savior. But the thing is, you lose your joy. It is this dangerous circle. Once you defile, you lose your joy. When you have no joy, you don't want to make yourself holy anymore. It's a self-defeating cycle. But on the other hand, be joyful and purify yourself. If there is anything that is defiling you, Get out of it and seek Christ and he will help you how to purify yourself. Be united with Christ and he will give you purity. Be united with Christ and he will give you his holiness and you will experience greater amount of joy. And finally, let us learn to sacrifice our life. Let us learn to sacrifice our time. Let us learn to sacrifice our talent for the sake of the kingdom of God. Because all other things that you invest in is going to be destroyed. The only thing that will remain is the work of Christ. If you invested your money in the work of Christ, it will remain. If you have invested your time in the work of Christ, it will remain. If you have invested your talents in the work of Christ, it will remain. But my Chipsanim and I were walking on a mountain some days before, and he's just told, what is the use of building robots? He's a robotic scientist. Robot and make all kinds of these uh, weapons and all. At the end of the day, they are going to be destroyed. What's the point of doing it? You may be a greatest scientist inventing a satellite, but one day it's going to be also destroyed. But you invest in the kingdom of God that is going to last for eternity. Amen? Shall we close our eyes?